and let's start. You can see both, yeah. Okay, last time we stopped at the definition of entropy. Right, this is equation 2.21 in Kittel and Cromer. So we, this definition, we can define the, when the maximum of your distribution is going to occur. So we had this curve over here. We took the derivative, made it equal to zero. And so we find this point over here. So that point is, when you put the two subsystems uh, in contact. All right, so this is a uh, partial derivative of the entropy of one with respect to the change in energy of one, when you keep the number of particles constant equals the partial derivative of the entropy of the second system or subsystem with respect to the energy of the second subsystem, keeping the number of particles constant in that subsystem as well. So this is pretty important. Uh, this one is 2.22. This one is pretty important is the condition for Uh, thermal equilibrium. So you have thermal equilibrium if this is true. And if this is true, you have thermal equilibrium. So it goes in both directions. So what happens when, let's say that you have Let's see that you have um, this axis is energy. And this point over here is U hat, U1 hat. So you can express U2 in terms of U1. So you only need U1 over here. Um, U1 hat is the energy at which this peak uh, occurs, where you have the, the maximum. So if you bring two systems or subsystems one has U1, N1, and S1, this is has energy U2, N2, and it's called S2. Um, initially, how are their uh, energy distributions going to look like? I guess more, more explicitly, um, where do you expect U1 zero, so the initial uh, energy of one, and u two zero, the initial energy of two, where do you expect those to be with respect to u one hat? What do you mean? Yeah, they will equilibrate. That means that initially, where are they? 
correct? Mm -hmm. And with respect to U1, U1 hat? Yes, so if you had to put U1 initial somewhere along this axis and U2 initial somewhere along this axis, where will you put it? Where will you put them? What you're saying is that U1 hat is going to be some sort of average. Yes. So if it's some sort of average, Mm -hmm. So maybe U1 is going to be U1 initial, it's going to be here, and U1, U2 initial over there. Yeah. All right. Yes. So they're going to be on opposite sides of that U1 hat, right? Because U1 hat is that sort of thermal average. Um, from this information, we don't know which one is going to be to the left and which one is going to be to the right. It depends on which one has more energy, but we do know that they're going to be on on opposite sides of U1 hat. So then, if they are on different sides, what are these derivatives telling you that it's going to happen? Well. Think about them. They're going to tell you that if the energy is under U1 hat, then this one is going to try to move towards U1 hat. So it's going to gain energy. And this one is going to move towards U1 hat in the other direction. So it's going to lose energy. So this is what happens also with temperature, right? So uh, we're going to use these 2.22 as the definition of temperature. Okay, so what is the entropy before they are in, in thermal contact? What is the entropy of the system? Right. So entropy of the system is entropy of one plus entropy of two yeah, initial. And entropy is just the natural log uh, of G, right? So uh, it will be G one initial and G times G two initial. Okay, so when we have Multiplicities, we multiply them. Uh, when we take the natural log to make it a, an entropy, we add them. So uh, it's useful to have the natural log in the definition of the entropy because your numbers are not as humongous. That's one of the, of the benefits. But notice that multiplicity and entropy are the same thing, right? It's just a number of ways you can arrange things. Okay, so we know that in thermal equilibrium, and I guess this is more of a, an ax uh, axiom or observation uh, at this point, T1, is equal to T2, All right? So initially the two objects have different temperatures. You put them together, they can touch, they can exchange energy and their temperatures are going to equilibrate. So uh, we're going to define one over tau as the derivative of sigma with respect to U at constant n. Um, why one over tau instead of tau? One way to look at it is with the units. What are the units of entropy? Yeah, just a number, right? So no units. What are the units of energy? Some joules, so 
um, what would be the unit of tau? Uh, well, we can move the tau over here and the joule over here, right? The joules. So temperature is. Uh, Yeah, yeah, sure. So this one is called the fundamental uh, temperature. And indeed, it is different than the regular temperature that we use. What are the units of temperature? Kelvin. So, what, there, there is a proportionality constant. So I'll continue using this. There is a proportionality constant between the fundamental temperature and the real temperature. So the units here are joules. The units here are Kelvin. So the proportionality constant should be to have what units? Let's say KB. Boltzmann. Although so he described it, he understood the concept. But the guy who actually, you know, coined, um, I guess, this term is um, or S equals KB natural log of omega, and is what is written on his on his tombstone. Um, Planck put it together. Hmm? He he invented it. Max, Max Planck did a lot. We'll see. Uh, Boltzmann he invented uh, uh, statistical mechanics. The other big guy is uh, Gibbs, Willard Gibbs. Um. So yeah, the units are joules per Kelvin, and that this constant is called uh, the Boltzmann uh, the Boltzmann constant. So you know it is kind of um, an accident, very understandable, but an accident of history that we use temperature in Kelvin as opposed to joules. It's because we were able to measure temperature way before we understood that it was not just an energy an, an average energy but still so that's why you use the proportionality constant one of the things that i like about this book is that they just use tau because you know why write kb two thousand times in the book unnecessarily so we're going to use the fundamental temperature. Remember that the difference is just uh, KB. Okay, so the, I guess, uh, so tau equals KBT, that is equation 2.27. And the values of the Boltzmann's, uh, Boltzmann constant are 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin. And in perhaps more useful units, uh, 8.617 times 10 to the negative five electron volts per Kelvin. So when we do use 
uh, KB later in the course, we mostly are going to be using the electron bolt for Kelvin. Electrons, and so it's a easier unit to manage than joules. It's many orders of magnitude um, smaller, so your numbers are not as crazy. Okay, and this is uh, two point twenty-five. Can you still see that? Oh, barely. Okay, never mind. Um, so I guess it's here. Um. All right, so using these same concepts, one over T, regular temperature, is going to be KB, and then tau is just that, the derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy at constant n. Um, so this is kb um, over tau. So you're going to get that. KB uh, did I do over here? Oh yeah. So this KB times uh, sigma sigma is the fundamental entropy that is going to be s the regular entropy so in most uh, statistical mechanics books you're going to see s instead of sigma so you get that kb sigma is equal to s so this is equation 2.30 so this again, this is like the regular thermodynamic entropy, and this is the fundamental entropy that we're going to be using. And again, the difference is just uh, the the proportionality constant. Okay, so let's move to this other side again. So consider two systems that are in contact, in thermal contact, but they are still not in, in thermal equilibrium. So their temperatures are, are different. Um, let's say that this, is, this, this one has temperature tau two, and this one has temperature tau one. In which direction is the energy going to flow? from if tau 2 is greater than tau 1 energy flows from which one to which one from 2 to 1 okay so mm, we can move this one over here, one over tau one greater than one over tau two. Right? Just move this one over here, this one over there. So this implies that one minus tau one, uh, sorry, over tau one minus one over tau two is greater than zero. 
And so this implies that the derivative of sigma one with respect to u one when you keep n one constant minus sigma uh, derivative of sigma two with respect to u two when you keep n two constant is greater than zero. And here you can see more clearly what I mentioned before. Um, one of them is going to be greater. So this one is going to be greater in this case, if you want it to be um, greater than zero. So the derivative is going to be in one direction. This derivative is going to be in the opposite direction. So they're going to find themselves somewhat uh, somewhere in the middle, not, not necessarily the middle exactly. Okay, so um, if you have the opposite case, Uh, energy will flow from one to two, uh, and you end up with essentially the opposite case. So one over T1 smaller than one over uh, tau two, and you end up with derivative of sigma one with respect to u1, when you keep n1 constant, plus derivative of um, sigma 2, u2, and 2 constant, uh, it's going to be greater than 0. Mm, I changed the the sign when I multiply with an times a negative one, but this is the end result. Uh, yeah, I mean, it will be, you know, one over tau one, one over tau two, less than zero. And then you get, um, I don't have much space. Uh, this one. And still less than zero. So then you can take the negative here. And that changes the, the sign of the less than or greater than. Um, okay, so energy, um, more generally, right here again. So, you know, look at those derivatives are at your leisure and convince yourself of what they do. So if energy is removed from one and because of conservation of energy transferred to two, then the change in entropy it's going to be a derivative of sigma one with respect to u1 and one. And then you can put a negative delta u here, which is the you're, you're removing it from one plus a derivative of sigma two with respect to u2 and two constant. And then this one is plus 
delta u. So you're trying, you're giving that energy to number two. This is equal to minus one over tau one plus one over tau two, which is kind of what we got before, times delta u. This is equation from Kittel and Cromer 2.31. Uh, yes, the individual entropies, but this is the total entropy of the of the combined system. So, from this from this equation, you can observe a few important things. The change in entropy is equal to zero. if T1 equals T2, sorry, tau. But the, um, the transverse is also true. If the temperatures are equal, the change of entropy is zero. Right, so, Uh, when two objects have the same temperature, that is the state of maximum entropy of the system. The entropy cannot increase more. But if they have different temperatures, uh, when they try to equilibrate their temperatures, their entropy is increasing. They're trying to, to maximize that entropy. So this is a very interesting relationship. Um, it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg kind of thing. So do the temperatures equilibrate because they're trying to maximize the entropy or does or is the entropy maximum because they're trying to equilibrate their temperature? Well, it's it's they are both correct. I mean, like, I, I don't think you can say that one causes the other. It's just the same phenomenon. But, you know, I think it's, huh? Yin and yang. It's kind of cool to see that um, entropy and temperature are so closely related. And, you know, I, I think um, we will see this uh, in detail later. But the free energy is equal to U uh, minus uh, tau sigma TS uh, plus pressure and volume. So um, these variables, you always see them together. So if you think about pressure and volume, you know, when you change the volume, the pressure changes. But if you change the pressure, the, the volume changes, right? They're also connected at that level. Like they, they are kind of the same thing. And that's why you have um, both of them in your, in your free energy. And there are other pairs that maybe we'll see. So yeah, this is really cool. Um, if you think about the, the consequences at perhaps the universe level. Um, we have not proved it yet, but if entropy is always increasing, what does that mean about the temperature of the universe? Yep. So the temperatures are equilibrating, right? So, um, What's going to happen with the temperature of the universe is the same everywhere. Yeah. That's right. There, there will be no transfer of energy. 
So that, that is going to be the, the heat death of the universe. There are other important consequences uh, if, you know, we don't know for sure, but if the increase of entropy is what drives the arrow of time, when the universe reaches thermal equilibrium, time will cease to exist as we know it. There will be no change, so you will not be able to tell what is past and what is present. I mean, there will be there will be change, right? The particles will be moving, but there will be no way to distinguish between future and past. Like, you know, if you jump into a if you dive into a swimming pool, it's very easy to tell which direction is forward, right? Um, you splash all this water, and you really cannot you know put it back together. Uh, if you come out of a swimming pool, like a, a recorded, you know, you record a video and you play it backwards, you know that it's being played backwards. But what if, you know, uh, when we reach that time, everything is going to look just like you're in the jumping into the water, the future and the past. This is the particles, but then there will be air, right? No air? That's very likely, yes. I, it's probably going to be only uh, like radiation. So that's why you want the present and past to change. You want to distinguish, like, like a pool, like both. That, that's part of it because um, if you have a, a bunch of radiation distributed in the in space, that has a higher entropy than a chunk of matter, than a rock. So the maximum state of entropy of the universe is just going to be a, a sea of particles, you know, and almost homo, homogeneous in every direction. So this, these are these are really cool equations. You know, like they allow you to excited. get excited about the end of the universe. Um, Okay, uh, yes, so if they're not in content equilibrium, then the entropy always uh, increases and we're gonna, we're gonna see that. Um, why will that happen? That, that the entropy of a combined object is always greater than the entropies of a, uh, a system that has not been combined yet. The temperature? Good. Uh, we're going to look at an example. Uh, so, there are, okay, I guess before I go into this, I'm going to say something before that. Um, where did I put it? So these are different ways in which you can increase the entropy of a system. And we're gonna look pretty much all at all of them. Entropy increases if you uh, add particles to a system. Remember that entropy is the number of states available. So if you add particles to a system, you have more states. Yes. Um, but if you add energy, that also increases the entropy. If you add entropy, if you add energy to the system, they can move faster. So there are more states that are available to them. Right? And it can happen at the same time, of course. But it, it's true separately. So 
it depends. So uh, we have been looking at systems that are kind of the same size, but for pretty much the rest of the of the course, we're going to look at a reservoir that has infinite energy, essentially infinite size to the universe, and a system that is much smaller than the reservoir. And so the properties of the system change a lot, while the properties of the reservoir are almost unchanged. So you, know, you can imagine that if this system has 100 particles and in the reservoir you have um, you know, 10 to the 30 particles, um, there's not going to be much difference for the reservoir if it keeps particles to, um, to this one. But yes, um, also if you increase the volume, you in increase the number of states available. And if you decompose molecules, that also, uh, what kind of molecules? That's like body. Yeah, it, it is. It is similar. Um, and also, I don't think we're going to see this one, but let a linear polymer curl up. So this one is really cool because um, this is, you will have the same equations, but in one dimension, you know, as opposed to three. So if you grab, um, let's say, um, uh, how do you call it? Ah, I forgot. A rubber band. Um, the ground state energy or the, you know, the state of minimum free entropy for the rubber band is curled up. Uh, that's also true for polymers. You know, like if you have a, a chain of carbons and, and hydrogens, uh, the state that minimizes the, their free energy is when they're curled up like that instead of being extended. No, no, this is just the entropy the entropy part. But in one dimension, being curled up is what maximizes the entropy. This is different in three dimensions. Okay, so these are ways in which uh, entropy increases. So, um, consider, an Einstein solid. Uh, we don't need to know the details at this point. We will spend quite a bit of time with Einstein solids in the future. But um, essentially what you can do with these, you have U1 equals five. Um, N1 equals two, and this is system one. Mm, the particles in this system are distinguishable. So you're gonna have red particles and green particles. And that this is what makes them different than just having like a, a gas in there. And we have another one of these. Uh, it has blue particles and white particles, well, one blue particle and one white particle. This one has one red and one green. So here U2 equals one and N2 equals 
uh, two, and this is system two. Okay, so the microstates that are available to this system are, um, so this is red particle and green particle. Right? They're gonna be five zero. So the red particle has all the energy and the green particle has no energy. Or it could be four one, three two, uh, two three, one four, and zero five. Right, so um, those are the microstates. This one, it has two particles and only one unit of energy. So it could be one zero or it could be zero one. Oops. Okay, so if we look at the number over here, this one has six microstates and this one has two. So the total, before you bring them uh, in contact, is going to be how many microstates? Well, for each of these options, you have these two options. So six times two. 12. Okay. When you bring them together, then I have my table over here. You want microstates G, G1, so the multiplicity, uh, I should have written G over here. Um, U2, microstates, and G2, and over here, G1, G2, the product of both. So the options are. Yes, ensembles. So we can have U1 has six units of energy. So let's say that it took the energy from, from, from the blue white from system two. And so this energy then will be zero. So the microstates that are available are zero, zero. Uh, but this one has more. This one has six, zero, um, five, one, four, two, three, three, two, four, one, five, and zero, six. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, and this one has one. So what is the multiplication? Seven times one, seven. You're gonna see a trend, so I don't have to write everything. The next one, five and one. And that one we already know, right? Is this one over here. So we know that this one has six, this, and this one has two, this ones, and the total is 12. Hey. Hello, how are you? I'm still alive. <laughs> Entropy hasn't taken a hold of you? <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this one has four units of energy. This one's gonna have two. So the options here are gonna be for zero, 
three one two two one three and zero four and this one so one two three four five and this one is going to have two zero one one and zero two so the options here are three and here you can probably see the trend already so the g1 times g2 is going to be 15. Uh, over here, three. This is going to be seven, six, five, four. This one is going to have three also. So this one's going to have four. Four times four, 16. Two. Um, and we already did two. Mm, it's this one. Wait, so this is going to be. Oh, no, we did one. Anyway, this is three. This one is going to have four, which we did already. So this is five. So three times five, 15. And this is one. Uh, so this is going to be two. This is going to be five. So this is going to be six. And so this is 12. And finally, zero. And so this is going to be one. This is going to be six. This is going to be seven. This is going to be seven. OK, so one of the important things to notice here, um, well, I think I have a different color, you know? So what is the total number of states that are available to the combined system? Well, if you add everything, it's gonna be uh, 84. And 84, is definitely greater than 12. But is this number going to be always greater than this number, like when the systems are not in contact? Yes, because the combined one includes the original one. But in addition, has all these other states. So when you combine objects, it's just a consequence of the math that you have more options. So energy, so entropy increases and temperature gets equilibrated. So what is going to be the most likely configuration? You know, we have very few particles and so these doesn't you know, quite yet looks like a, like a normal distribution, but it is, uh, or it's already starting to look like it, right? So it has a maximum at 16, and then it goes to like 15, and then that's it, right? So the maximum here is 16, and over here the minimum is seven. What is the what is the configuration, the, the most probable configuration? This one, right? So three and yeah. So most probable is gonna be system one. Uh, I guess uh, energy one is three and energy two is three. So which one gained energy and which one lost energy? Mm -hmm. 
So that means that energy flew from this one to this one, right? So in the most probable configuration, um, the energy moves from the hotter, and it has more energy, to the colder um, system. Is it possible that energy flows from the cooler object to the hotter? Yes. I mean, it's possible, but the probability is really tiny. And as you increase the number of particles, the probability becomes negligible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, these are like quantized units of energy, but energy is quantized anyway. Okay, so this um, Einstein solid, um, I like it quite a bit. So that's why there are, I think, two problems in the next homework about the Einstein solid. Okay, so if you just want to look at the entropy, so the entropy in this case was natural log of 12. So um, it's equal to natural log of six plus natural log of two. Um, it's a good idea to review the properties of the uh, natural logs because we're gonna be using them. Uh, so, this is going to be just sigma equals 2.48. And over here, um, it's going to be natural log of 84. So sigma is um, 4.43. And if you want to look at the change in entropy, that would be natural log uh, of 84 minus natural log of 12. So that's equal to natural log of 84 divided by 12, which is 7. Natural log of 7, which is um, 1.95. Right, so when you put the, when they reach thermal equilibrium, these two systems, the entropy gain is 1.95. So it's, the entropy is quite a bit higher than in the, in the first case. Was that? Yes, of course. This is the pedestrian way of doing it. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of this one. Yeah, you know, I kind of like to convince myself that these things are true by looking at the simpler examples. So the multiplicity of the two systems that you brought into contact is going to be equal to the sum over all the possible u1s. Remember that we can express u in terms of u1. Uh, sorry, U2 in terms of U1. So G1, U1, G2, U minus U1, instead of using U2. This is equation 2.33. And this is exactly what we did. You know, we're looking at all the possible multiplications with, with all the possible values of U, U1. So from six to 
uh, to zero. So this is a math way of expressing it. And you can see that the, that the original one is uh, G1, U1, zero, G2, U2, zero. Uh, actually, this will be U minus U1 original. So the original entropy or multiplicity of the system is but one of the terms uh, that are included when you when you uh, combine the systems in, in thermal equilibrium. So we also saw that saw that when um, when I highlighted that that row. Okay, so in the paper that we read, I guess the discussion was due on Monday. It was about the Sally's. Uh, entropy. And it was um, some parametrization of, of the Boltzmann entropy. And what the guy is saying, you know, it's unclear whether this is true or not, is that the entropy is definitely uh, you know, natural log of G in thermal equilibrium. But what he says is that while the system is traveling to thermal equilibrium, the entropy, you know, is a little bit smaller. Um, I guess that's, uh, has been proven difficult to Yes. Yeah, that, that's that's the take home message of the paper. And you know, I, I think it's possible. Um, if you think about it, almost everything in the universe is um, it's not in thermal equilibrium. It's traveling towards thermal equilibrium. So you know the, the Earth. System, or you have like you know when you're pouring milk into your coffee. So uh, you know chaos uh, lives in that state. Chaos cannot live in maximum entropy or no entropy. It lives in between. Life also. So our existence. Uh, it has to be in between. We could not live in an environment of maximum entropy. You know, we will not be able to gather the energy that we need to live, um, or in a, in an environment of zero entropy. Um, also, will not be able to to gather uh, energy. So life uh, exists in a gradient uh, of entropy and energy. So you know, it's it's pretty beautiful. Um, okay, so physical processes at the microscopic level are time symmetric. So if you look at um, you know twenty particles and you know they interact with each other, they bounce off you know the walls and everything. You can describe everything by you know, using uh, uh, Newton's equations, right? And they work equally well if you fast forward. Uh, into the future or into the past, if you rewind. There's nothing, they're just equations, right? So there's nothing in, um, in Newton's law that tell you what is the future and what is the past. That's at the microscopic level. At the macroscopic level, you know, uh, our understanding and our experience of life is that uh, there is definitely a, a direction to time. Uh, nobody gets younger, right? So, <laughs> who knows, man? Maybe 
is what we need. But um, there are several ideas on you know why, what is the case, but definitely one of the uh, you know the best regarded, the most important is that um, thermodynamic time is so you know the the fact that um, sigma always increases or remains equal. The fact that this is the case, you know, this gives you a direction. Things are moving in the direction of the molecular, um, at least locally. So I think that's one of the big unanswered questions. Why time flows or seems to flow in the direction that it does? But this is, uh, this is definitely consistent with what we observe. So you know, maybe it's the, um, the combined action of all the particles that gives you a macroscopic state that gives you time. Okay, so loss of thermodynamics. How many are there? Uh, yeah, it's close to three. Uh, approximately three. <laughs> What is the zeroth one? Uh, zeroth law. If two, right. Yes. So what that means is that if T1 is equal to, or sorry, tau, tau three, uh, if, uh, and tau two is equal to tau three, then tau one is equal to tau two. Okay, so pretty easy. Correct, so the first law Um, energy is always conserved. So du, uh, which will be du1 minus du2, or vice versa, um, is equal to zero. So energy is conserved. What about the second one? Say that again. Entropy. This. The, I guess we can write it. Well, you just proved that it cannot be any other way. We just did it. I, I think that's like the strongest law that you can find. There's a mathematical way for that not to be true. So the change in entropy is greater than or equal to zero. So if they are in thermal equilibrium, the change in entropy is zero. That's your best case scenario. If they're not in thermal equilibrium, then entropy is increasing. So, you know, there's a, I think, you are very used to the first law, you know, from all the, your other physics classes. This one is perhaps on more solid ground. You know, this seems to be the conservation of energy. It comes from the physics. It has been proven to be true. If you go into general relativity, then you have, again, it's the, the thing that is conserved is the, the mass energy tensor, right? Um, this comes from the physics, the conservation of energy. This comes from the math, right? So do not bet against the second law. That's always the, uh, the advice. 
Huh? The second law? We just proved it. Is that simple? You mean it's possible for a system to lose en uh, entropy? Yeah. No. We have never observed anything like that in the history of the universe. Oh, yeah, but that doesn't mean that it's not true. It is not possible. Okay. <laughs> you know, we, it, it's, 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 it's here. The, before they are combined, that's, that is just one term in that, in that sum. After they are combined, the entropy is greater. That's it. So you can decrease the entropy by doing work on a system. But in order to do work on a system, you need energy. To gather that energy, you're going to increase entropy. So there is no way to overall decrease entropy. Right? So these two things are, um, I think, our, our most solid understanding of, of the universe. First law and the second law. And as you can tell, I'm, I'm partial towards the second law. I like it. OK, so the third one. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that is a um, consequence of, of quantum mechanics. So wait, oh yeah, didn't remember how to write this one. Yeah, the limit uh, as tau goes to zero of sigma of the entropy is constant. So uh, you're right. This is essentially uh, because of, uh, of the uncertainty principle. As t goes to 0, the energy goes to 0. That means that the velocity of the particles go to 0. And if the velocity of the particles goes to zero, then that means that their wavelength uh, increases. Right? So you don't know what their position is. And that is a fundamental constraint of the universe also. So you cannot decrease the temperature enough that your entropy will be zero. It will always be something. It might be tiny, but it's going to be there. Um, and this you can measure this easily with a uh, heat capacity measurements. Okay. So this is the end of chapter two. We are a little bit behind, but not terribly. Um, so I wanted to start looking at chapter three today, which is the Boltzmann distribution, but it's fine. Um, I think this, this is pretty good. So the first exam, I'm going to post it on February 15th or so. I think it's going to be due February 21st. So you're going to have a week. It's going to include the first three chapters. Okay. So we have to cover chapter three. Um, next week. Yes, what is the question? Yes? Yes. Yes. <laughs> wow. 
who's this? Who's who's asking this question? Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Well, um, you know, it's not on the syllabus. Um, so the scenario that you're describing, that you get 11 points from one and 12 from the other, uh, that will not qualify you from automatic A. So, you know, I, I do that to incentivize you guys to, um, to, to work on those. Um, you know, I, I think if you're missing that one point and, you know, you did otherwise well in the course and you, know, you will not get a, an A otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm fairly flexible, but, you know, if there's like four people, you know, in that situation, then it gets a little bit more complicated. So I will recommend, you know, just try your best to get the 12 and 12. Um, correct. So that, that is in the, you know, that's another track to get an A, which is getting a bunch of, fun, of, of points everywhere. So yeah, you, you have to pick your strategy. Okay, I'm gonna stop recording.